It has been five long years, but we are finally here at the next frontier of Sonic's journey with Sonic Frontiers. The first mainline title since Sonic Forces came out those many years ago. Something we've all been anticipating, for better or worse, will it be good? Now, I haven't finished the game yet, so I can't answer that question, but I have made it roughly halfway through the second island, uh, Ares, I believe it's called. And that's been plenty of time to get a grip on the basics of the game, at the very least. I went into this optimistic. Of course, I have my reservations based on Sega's recent track record, but in the lead up to Frontiers, we had seen increasing evidence that there may have been something special with this game. Since I've only gotten as far as I have, we're going to treat this as a first impressions video rather than any sort of major review, which will be coming later on once I beat the game. I'll also probably do a couple videos here on there on isolated topics I feel like deserve more attention than mashed together in this impressions video. Originally, this was going to be around 28 minutes long, uh, but I thought, hmm, I'm not sure everyone's going to sit through all of that. So I'm doing a restructuring of my first impressions for this video, where we're going to keep things nice and streamlined. I've got a list of bullet points in front of me, and we're just going to work off of them. But later on, in a different video, I'll probably expand some of these concepts to their own thing. One of the major things I think we were all questioning is the gameplay. How does it feel? More specifically, the controls. How are they going to work? These have been something that recent Sonic games have been very polarized around. Some people didn't see this as an issue. Other people felt the controls have been a downgrade on what we used to get in the past. And Frontiers has its new open world structure to contend with alongside the more traditional stages. A lot on its plate to handle. So with that in mind, my thoughts on the controls are, are they had potential to be excellent. And in the open world, you can really see what they're going for with minor issues, I'll say, minor issues when you're playing in the open world. For the most part, though, it works as intended. Sonic has full 360 degrees movement. You're able to jump, you're able to boost, you're able to double jump, you can slide kick, though that decreases your speed rather than increasing it. You can drop dash, which lets you spin in a ball on the ground and boost forward like Sonic used to do. And this does let you gain speed depending on where you do it. Uh, you have your face buttons on the controller uh, allocated to different maneuvers such as dodging, parrying, attacking. And these all come together to allow Sonic to do a mixture of movement and combat seamlessly weaving between the two as often as you feel is necessary. And it's, it's usable. But there, there are some minor issues, like I said. Sonic will not turn that great once he's in the air. You can make his character model rotate. His eye direction can shift, but his body, his positioning won't move with you. It will mostly stick to its original trajectory. And whilst that's maybe a more realistic way for jumping to work, it's not great for platforming and is not how traditionally Sonic handles in the air at all. This may not sound like a huge issue and in the open world unless you're dangling off a cliff which will happen it's not a massive issue but in cyberspace it becomes a lot worse and in fact cyberspace's controls unlike the controls for the open world are frankly quite dreadful. They are the worst offender for the control scheme in this game. The overworld definitely fares better. There are strange hang-ups, it feels like. Vestiges of the Frontiers gameplay engine, which obviously this game was built off of. But you can really feel that link to the old gameplay when you're in cyberspace. You've got different parameters, different statistics. And Sonic is now focused on running down linear paths rather than exploring an expansive world. And some issues that arise from this is boosting. In the overworld, boosting doesn't have any hitbox on it, and it gives you a boost of speed in the direction Sonic's eyes are pointing, and this is fine. But in cyberspace, 
this can mess you up. You're no longer invincible, which I'm not complaining about. I think invincible boosting was a big mistake, but that means you're vulnerable. And now, if you turn slightly to avoid an obstacle or reposition Sonic, his eyes will be facing diagonally forward rather than straight forward. In a traditional boost game, which Cyberspace is based on, if you press boost, he'll boost forward as you plan. In this game, if his eyes are not looking forward and you press boost, he will slam into one of those diagonal directions, most likely either off a cliff or into a wall. This gets very frustrating very quickly. Some people will say, ah, but that's why you have the sidestep, quick step. Well, yes and no. You do have the quick step. You can press the shoulder buttons to make Sonic take a predetermined distance to the right or left very quickly whilst maintaining a forward facing direction. The issue is it actually just uses the dodge world from the overworld. So you can press this button and overshoot or undershoot the object the game was hoping you would hit naturally. Another issue with the control scheme is how the players are taught about it. As I mentioned before, Sonic has maneuvers such as the drop dash, he also has the light speed dash, but the game doesn't actually teach you these in a normal way. The Psy Loop, the new ability to run in a circle and blow things up, is taught to the player in a proper tutorial, but these other advanced movement options are hidden behind tutorial missions that have a random chance of showing up on a loading screen. And what makes this even more ironic is one of the first stages you do in the game has a optional path that looks like it's going to be the major path when you first get there that requires the light speed dash, but you probably have no idea how to perform it. I know I didn't, so I had to waste a bunch of time until I figured out, oh, there's somewhere else I can go. And I don't know why they did it this way instead of just showing you how to do it with the Psy Loop. It's a pretty important maneuver. And for the drop dash, even when you learn how to do it, it's so convoluted, you have to wonder why didn't they just let you do a normal jump command. To do drop dash, you must jump, then use your double jump, and then press jump a third time, but hold it this time, and only then will Sonic begin the drop dash. However, I've noticed if you weren't quick enough on your third jump press and Sonic is no longer in a ball, he will not charge a jump, uh, a drop dash from the air. So it's so te unnecessarily tedious. All it needed to be is hold jump once and you'll drop dash because there's no other mechanic where holding the jump button does anything. So why did they make you have to press it three times instead of press and hold it once? There's issues like that that just get on your nerves. And in cyberspace, talking about jumping again, that issue I was talking about where Sonic won't really move mid-air once you've jumped, that will kill you so many times in this game because since the 360 degrees movement Sonic of the overworld is stuck in these linear boost stages, he will sometimes accidentally face a different direction than forward in a split second just by you doing a micro movement of your analog stick but that change of direction when you jump means he will be sent instead of forward wherever the eyes were going and then you can't turn your way around which means you probably cascaded off into the abyss this has been the most cause of death for my sonic in cyberspace and has actually been the one thing that makes getting those S ranks slightly difficult, which doesn't make it fun because you know you were going to do it and then Sonic ends up getting himself killed one way or another through control mishaps. And they are control mishaps. You may not think there's anything wrong with the controls when you observe it being played, but I assure you when you have that controller in your hand and you're playing cyberspace, you will experience Sonic doing all sorts of weird things you definitely did not intend or want him to do. It will happen. And one last thing on his core controls, which again is, well actually this is kind of an issue for both the overworld and cyberspace. Jumping makes Sonic hit a very specific speed, a very specific momentum. If he's below it, he will gain to it, but if he's above, he'll quickly decelerate to that. And the problem is it's not very fast. So you could be boosting, you could even be jogging or just running downhill, you jump and suddenly you're going far shorter than you intend. 
this becomes an issue especially for cyberspace but also in the other world let's say there was a floating hoop you want to jump through to get a boost over a bottomless pit you're running at decent speed there's no other obstacles distracting you normally you time your jump and enter the ring but now if you time your jump based on common sense putting your speed into consideration you will fall short of the hoop because sonic will then immediately slow down in the air and no longer reach that hoop and depending on where this is it could result in your death i think the developers were aware of all of these design issues for the controls i've just gone over though because the air boost works a lot more like in unleashed where it's a one-time shoot forward air dash of a burst of speed but then it ends unlike forces superhero boost but the difference is you now gain height when you do it and this is both good and bad or double bad depending on how you view it because if you're about to die from sonic having a very unwanted action based on the inputs you did you can press this boost and thanks to going up you'll probably get back on the stage as long as you did it quick enough but also it cheeses the game because if you just honestly fail the platforming challenge and are on your way to the bottomless abyss a lot of the time and i've done this myself you can press the boost to clip back onto whatever's above you since sonic gains height and you'll be just fine and i use this to great effect in i think it's cyberspace stage one two uh, i've seen people start saying it's one of the hardest uh, levels to s rank i can't verify that i'm still not done with the game but anyway i was able to s rank it by abusing this ability to just skip entire sections where usually that would result in a guaranteed death thanks to the air boost I cheat death and save time. So that's why it's either good and bad or double bad, depending on your thoughts on game integrity. Switching gears to some positives though, the world design so far for the islands have been very nice. There's been a nice variety in the terrain within a single island. The first island, Kronos, you have these flowery fields, watery creeks, great forests, open plains, mountainous climbs, Eggman tech and above the ocean. There's a nice change up, mix up. You've got these floating areas as well that are slightly harder platforming challenges than everything below you. The existence of rails all over the sky was something that I wasn't too sold on and a lot of other people criticized before the game came out. Now that we've got the game, turns out that these rails are sort of a fast travel light mechanic where they spawn between major checkpoints after you complete them, allowing you to get on a rail and return to these spots instead of having to use a fast travel all the time, which helps you feel more integrated in the world despite their mere floating existence taking you out of the world. It sort of balances each other out. Is it ideal? No, not really, but I can see what they were going for now. And it's weird that I don't think once any of the developers in interviews or statements ever actually explained why they did that they just there they are but it's clear that's the reason i can respect it again not necessarily the way i would have gone about it maybe using wind grind rails like from sonic 06 specifically for connecting to checkpoints would have felt more natural but hey ho it's fine and some of the things you can find in the uh, overworld are quite enjoyable namely big the cat and his fishing extravaganza you've probably seen it in the trailers but yeah it's a fishing mini game and it has a nice music jingle reference to big's old fishing theme as well when you get a haul would it be better if there was a little bit more complexity yes in my opinion the fishing is overly simple you press one button and you have a lot of leeway in when you can press it but it's supposed to be relaxing so i'm not going to criticize it too much for that it is a relaxing time the music's nice and you just get to chill and fish something though that was very quickly grating on me is the character models that we've been complaining about these for a while especially when it looked like it was a sonic forces model and whilst it's been updated with nice textures and coloring definite improvement the actual polygons the the frame the skeleton is almost identical if not identical to the forces model 
And I know some of you are going to be upset that I'm even bringing this up. Oh, stop going on about this. But seriously, these are something that needed to be updated because they suffer at conveying emotion. And this is a heavily narratively directed experience. So when you've got rigid, stiff looking character models, it just saps so much of the energy out of a scene that otherwise would have had a heavier impact. This isn't saying that none of them land because the developers seem to have put in a lot of work to make these uh, character models actually animate and express sometimes in ways we've not seen them do in the main games for a long time. Their eyebrows move instead of just the eyelids, their cheek muscles alternate, and their body language can be rather animated. But again, that's only sometimes. Other times, it's what we've been seeing in Forces and before, where they barely move, their expressions barely change, and their arm movements are like a pensioner. And it just saps some of these possibly great scenes, and it just feels meh. Because presentation is a large part of visual medium and storytelling. The story in general could be great, but the problem is I barely know any of it, even though I've played about six hours so far. It has such a slow start. You turn on the game and there's two cutscenes and you're thinking it's going to help establish things. But not, no, no they don't. They, they give you the bare minimum and anyone who's been watching the trailers already knew what these introductory cutscenes tell you. And then you're just in the game, things happen, nothing is explained, and a lot of it is left up to your interpretation. And that's fine, right? I've played tons of games like that. It's just that even games that focus on that sort of abstract storytelling, like let's say Dark Souls, gave you more to go off in the beginning than Sonic Frontiers does. And so it just feels like there was a story and it just wasn't told to you and you're missing out. Characters at certain points will infer that they know something or someone knows something in a way that the player probably should know as well. And then I'm just sat there thinking, well, I have a couple guesses and estimates, but I don't actually know and no character or source in the game has helped confirm or deny them. So I don't really appreciate that. I, you, it's a bit patronizing in a way, it's saying, oh, you don't know what's going on, how couldn't you know? So yeah, maybe the story's great, again, I haven't finished the game, I'm hoping it's great, there was something in particular that was interesting, that I'll bring up in a minute, but other than that, I found the story admittedly lackluster, and that's a mixture of the character models not being able to express things well, and the story being so disconnected and shattered and spread out. The dialogue is definitely a step up though from recent games, that I can be sure of. It's just that the actual narrative I'm being fed leaves more to be desired so far. Going back to gameplay though, combat was another huge part of Sonic Frontiers advertising and something that set it apart from the past main games. Unfortunately, and this is being 100% honest with you guys, I can't say the combat is great. Now, some people are probably going to disagree with me heavily, and I can even understand why. Combat not being great is maybe an oversimplification, although I do believe it to be the truth. You actually have a fair amount of options for Sonic Frontiers combat, and some of them are more effective than others under certain situations, giving you a reason to experiment. There are a lot of maneuvers with very strange input commands to activate, just like how the drop dash was a bit awkward. And I think developers also agreed with this because there's even an unlockable skill to tell Sonic to just do them automatically since you probably will forget at least some of them due to how many convoluted options there are. But it's flashy, it looks good, the sounds are nice, and the combat doesn't last too long when you're fighting the normal enemies. Uh, except that stupid turtle shell creature, that is just not fun to fight in any way, shape or form. But yeah, combat. Seems so. Like, okay, where's the problem then, Mighty Emperor? What are you complaining about? The issue is Sonic Boom. The move where he kicks a lot and shoots projectiles at the enemies. I saw that in all the trailer footage and thought, wow, that's a good attack. I want it. But what I didn't know is that you could do it forever. In the cutscenes, it looked like he would do maybe 20 kicks and then the move would end. 
In the real game, he'll do as many as he can before he touches the floor, except he descends at a very slow rate. You may still be questioning why I'm complaining. The problem is, I just said how there are a lot of options in Sonic's toolkit, but you don't need any of them, because all you have to do to win anything in the game, and this includes the giant boss battles, is jump and Sonic Boom Kick. And that is it. It will delete everything. Each kick doesn't do an incredible amount of damage on their own, but you shoot so many, you're in the air, so most of the enemies can't even hit you, and then when you destroy one, you just start hitting the next. Easy peasy wins every scenario where the game lets you use it, and it invalidates everything. And if you're still not on board, let me remind you that Sonic Unleashed's Werehog was criticized heavily for being able to spam your way to victory with a very few options, and that's true, you can do that. This game lets you spam your way to victory with a single maneuver, not just a few, one. And it works because that's how I've been playing the game. So I think it's only fair to criticize Frontiers for something it does worse than Sonic Unleashed that it got criticized for. Not to say you can't enjoy it, like I said, there is a decent amount of mechanics and moves to mess around with, but it doesn't hide the fact that Sonic Boom is just overtuned. There is actually one other combat mechanic that can single-handedly win you the game alongside Sonic Boom, and that's the parry. I love parries as a skill-based reward that have been featured in so many games as of late, uh, a move where you must risk it all to take a lot of damage, but if you manage to be successful in a very small window of time, you'll open up the enemy for a great counter-attack. Now that last part still happens in Sonic Frontiers. The issue is the first section of parrying. The whole point of why parries should be in a game to begin with, Frontiers steps upon. When you hold the parry command in Sonic Frontiers, he will take a position, and that position will automatically counter any attack that contacts Sonic. You don't have to time a release, it will always do it as long as you have the button held down. So it's not skill at all, you just hold it down and wait for something to hit you and you will counter it every single time. Problem is, not only does it do that, but if it's done in the air, Sonic will freeze, not float, freeze, and just stay there forever as if he could fly until you either let go or he counters something. And you can use this to abuse so many fights and bosses and even traversal uh, platforming because you can just stop falling on command. I don't know how this version of the parry made it into the game, but it's not good. It's it's not just about saying, oh, it's too powerful. It flat out doesn't make sense and breaks the game. You can't use it everywhere all the time, but if you get creative, you'll see what I mean. Still, so far, Sonic Frontiers has definitely been a better experience than Sonic Forces and maintains my interest, if only because I want to see where everything is actually going to end up. One thing that definitely stuck out to me though, and this is a spoiler, so maybe uh, stop watching if you don't want to be spoiled on the story, but there's a couple scenes early on in the game, near the end of the first island and the beginning of the second, where you see flashes of the past about those Coco creatures, and they inhabit these ancient beings that seem to resemble Chaos Zero, but taller and bigger. And it seems that these ancients have something to do with the Chaos Emeralds, and that flags up so many questions in a good way. It's like, finally, something interesting connecting to the past, but presenting something new to explore. This is the continuity of Sonic the Hedgehog that I was talking about being missing ever since my first video where Sonic went wrong. The lacking continuity has been one of the biggest flaws of recent Sonic. Now, I haven't finished the game, so I can't say it's accomplished bringing it back or anything until I do that. But I'll say that this has been a very good sign 
and I've got all sorts of theories in my head that I'm sure the game will answer, which is why I'm going to save most of my thoughts until I've seen the rest of the story. But what I'll speculate on just for now is I think the Coco may be the remnants uh, not remnants, the ancestors of the Chow. We were speculating on this, but I think that's to be the case. But not only that, their bodies as we see the Coco are like the hearts or the memories of these ancient beings. And we hear, I think Knuckles says it, I can't remember, that some of them migrated to the Angel Islands at one point. And I think that those Coco that migrated to the Angel Islands became or were the ancestors of the chow that took all finds at the emerald altar with the master emerald since their old civilization would have had something to do with it now the big wrench in this idea is chaos himself because yes he resembles his ancients yes there's ties to the emeralds blah 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 yes maybe the coco were chow at one point but here's the problem chaos was definitely a chow not a Coco, a Chow. And even if the Coco later evolved to be Chow, it's strange that a Chow would look like Chaos Zero if the Coco had that look as well. It, it could be possible. He doesn't look exactly like them, and that could be why he was based off a of Chow instead. But uh, we'll see. I hope this wasn't an oversight and someone forgot Chaos's origins. We'll we'll see. That is probably the most interesting story thread for me right now, because it's the only one the game's given me <laughs> since we began. But yeah, Sonic Frontiers, first impressions. Wow, even this reduced video is actually quite long. What do you guys think of the game purely from a gameplay point of view? Please keep spoilers to a minimum. I'm going to have to ignore your comments if you put spoilers, and obviously other people probably haven't experience the game yet so be respectful but let me know how you feel about the game in a general sense and keep an eye out for future videos of mine i definitely plan to do some sort of theory or story analysis on maybe some of the characters as they show up and also definitely the coco stuff we were on about just a minute ago uh, and as well there will be a review whenever i beat the game and i have some time to just process everything and i'm hoping it will be a positive one but until then, I hope you have a great day and to see you next time. This is the Mighty Emperor signing off.